a lot of these mask mandates uh, do not have an end date to them, mm-hmm. which is for any, for, any, for any student of history and civil rights, uh, anything, anything that doesn't have a tangible end date that, that's, that's near, to the, near in the future uh, should make people nervous, right? I mean, there's a lot of examples of temporary measures. I mean, the Income Tax Act was temporary. All the measures after 9-11 were temporary. Well, here we are decades later with these temporary measures that are permanently in place. Let's take a breather to get through this one. No, you know what? Breath isn't gonna cut it. We need a song. Get up, stand up. Stand up for your rights. Ask yourself, would Bob Marley be walking around Canada right now wearing a mandated mask? I think he'd be singing that song. (laughs) Drea Humphrey here with Rebel News. And yes, you got it. It is another video on Canada's fascinating mandated mask journey. How can we stop talking about this when the mandates keep getting stricter and stricter regardless of what the COVID-19 count numbers, or numbers count, I said that backwards, are in the country? I mean, our kids are being mandated to wear masks when they head back to school in some places. This is where they're going to be for hours upon hours at a time. Not to mention, we now know that by the grace of God, COVID-19 is like a cold for our children. If you watched Ezra Levant's recent video on the possibility of mandated vaccinations, he rightfully points out that we lost one child with COVID-19. Now I emphasize the word with because according to Toronto City's news, she did not necessarily die from the virus, but rather with the virus while also battling other health conditions. While one child dying is one too many, when we compare that to the common flu, last year CBC reported that we lost six children within a span of a few months, most likely to H1N1. Yet here we are mandating, forcing children to wear masks when they return in some areas. Then we have Dr. Teresa Tam. I don't know why Canada hasn't gotten their much deserved second opinion when it comes to this doctor. Maybe it's still racist to even think so. But recently Dr. Tab has come late to the game yet again stating the obvious which is that no, we cannot put all of our eggs into one basket regarding the COVID-19 vaccination. CBC reports that Tam is now downplaying the hopes for the safe and effective vaccine, effective vaccine to bring us back to normalcy saying that the measures we have in place now could be with us for two to three years. That includes social distancing and I assume also includes wearing masks. Two to three more years, guys. It reminds me of the whole two week lockdown and here we are six months later, still not completely back to normal. Now, My last mandated mask video went into detail comparing some of the statistics behind the Canadian mask mandates and pointing out how they don't really add up to the mandates themselves. But today I'm asking whether or not Canadians who are against mandates are overreacting when it comes to masks or if they are underreacting if they see no issue with the government or politicians mandating them in the first place. To bring clarity to these questions, I interviewed James Kitchen. Kitchen is a lawyer with the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms in Calgary and is passionate about advocating for Canadians' fundamental freedoms. He is well equipped to speak about the mandate debate and has a message for Canadians about why we need to start taking our rights seriously, even if it's in the midst of a pandemic. Here's what James Kitchen had to say. A lot of these mask mandates uh, do not have an end date to them, mm-hmm. which is for any, for, any, for any student of history and civil rights, uh, anything, anything that doesn't have a tangible end date that, that's, that's near, to the, near in the future uh, should make people nervous, right? I mean, there's a lot of examples of temporary measures. I mean, the Income Tax Act was temporary. All the measures after 9-11 were temporary. Well, here we are decades later with these temporary measures that are permanently in place, right? It's, it's, it's it's very rare that your civil rights are taken away on a temporary basis, right? It, it, that's, that language is typically used when they're taken away, but a few years later you look back and you discover they're still gone. I don't know if you heard about that, but Nova Scotia mandated masks and they had one active case and zero people in the hospital for COVID. I mean, that's mind boggling to me. Like how, where is the law in that? 
in a decision like that. If the government wants to pass an unconstitutional law, a law that violates charter rights, they're able to do so. Uh, and, and it's unless and until citizens take them to court and litigate and have those laws struck down or have those, have those dissent, uh, decisions quashed, governments can pretty much do what they want and get away with anything, even in a democracy. That's how our system works. I don't think a lot of Canadians quite understand that. I get a lot of questions at the Justice Centre. How can they do this? How can they get away with this? What are our rights? Doesn't this violate our rights? Well, you know, the answer to that question is we have to go to court because the number one way to hold governments accountable is, is, is the courts, right? That's how our system is set up. There's executive, legislative, and judicial, right? That's, 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 that's the very bare bones, fundamentals, essentials of how the Canadian democracy is set up. And they each keep each other accountable. So if you don't use the judicial system to keep the legislature and executive accountable, then they can pretty much do what they want. And it makes no sense for what Nova Scotia has done, but you know, they, they, they can get away with it. They can. And I think that's a good message for a lot of people to hear, but then it's kind of, combated by some of the headlines we see in mainstream media. I mean, there's articles out there saying that people who don't want to wear masks are more likely to be psychopaths and narcissists. So you have people pitted against each other. And so you have that, then you have the fear, you have the fear of the virus, which, you know, there's a legitimate fear, but then there also seems to be fear coming at all angles that maybe isn't focused on the numbers so much. So there's all of these elements, these social elements of people who maybe do feel like their rights are being infringed upon, but there's there's a fear of actually coming forward with that. Do you have any advice on how to overcome that? The fear of government and the fear of, you know, the mob or or your, or your colleagues or your peers, uh, that's, that's always been there in Canadian society. And I think that's unfortunate. I think I think that's a stain on our society. But I've definitely seen it jump up the last few months. Uh, the fear amongst professionals of what of what their their colleagues are going to think of what of what the wider profession is going to think, and and then of course there's the general fear. I have a lot of clients uh, have really been scared of what the government's going to do, of how of how it's going how the government's going to respond. If they litigate, is the government going to target them? Uh, there's a lot of people that 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 have a have a deep seated fear that that the Canadian government has become sort of this banana republic, communist style type government that that takes reprisal against their citizens when their citizens exercise their rights. And whether or not that fear, you know, a legitimate fear, uh, I, I can see the basis for why that fear is there because that's how, that's how Canadian governments have generally acted the last five or six months. They've acted not as if they're governments of free and democratic societies, but is, as if they're governments from autocratic regimes across seas. So one of the other things that I hear often when it comes to the whole debate on rights and masks is the when you say you know i shouldn't be forced to wear a mask and then the other person says well you're putting me at risk if you're not wearing a mask and they kind of have this clash of rights so so what is the legal uh perspective on that constitutional rights are generally negative rights in the sense that they protect your right to uh not have to be forced to do something by the government and in the sense that the government should should back off and let you alone right? They're not positive rights, right? Like, um, you don't have a right uh, to not be offended, right? But you do have a right to speak freely, right? Mm -hmm. Which which implies you have a right to offend other people, right? If they get offended, that's 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 their issue, not yours. But this is part of the culture in Canada is this, you know, you, I have a right for you to do something that helps me or to protect me from something. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not how rights work, right? You don't have that right. A uh, government can try to give you that right, uh, through these mandates, but anytime they do that, they're taking away somebody else's right. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's there's a lot of people that would that would lean towards the left, be a little more authoritarian, like big government intervention. But those are typically the ones that are all about personal choice, personal autonomy, bodily autonomy. Right. Well, what what happened to you know? Why is it rights for thee, or, or rights for you, but not for me? Right. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if you want your right to bodily autonomy, you need to respect my right to bodily autonomy. That's 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 how it works in a free society, right? My body, my choice. Right. What happened to that? <laughs> Going forward, I, I think, you know, if, 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 you can, if you can make somebody cover up their face, how much farther is it to, to make them uh, put something in their body that they don't want to put into it, right? I mean, on to in is not really that far. I mean, if you can make, some, if you make somebody put something on. What is the, the simplest starting place for someone who, who wants to stand up for fundamental rights in a time like this in a country like Canada? Where should they go and what should they do? The simplest thing they can do 
is to exercise their rights. I get that question a lot. And the most important thing I could tell anybody to do is don't self-censor. You've got something to say, say it. Mm-hmm. Say it respectfully, say it intelligently, obviously, but, but, but say it. Don't hold back. Don't self-censor. Canadians are terrible at self-censoring. Yes. And it's, 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 that's the best way to ensure that you get more censorship in your society is if you censor yourself. Mm-hmm. Don't self-censor. Mm-hmm. Um, and then ex- exercise the rest of your rights too, of course, right? It, um, in general. But, uh, you know, obviously the other thing is I, I tell people, you know, people of means, uh, uh, put your money where your mouth is. If, if, if you believe in this stuff, you think it's important, mm-hmm. then you need to realize that um, only action is going gonna, is gonna to actually do something to defend it. And, and, and that necessarily means there needs to be some funds there. Not everybody can do yeah. that, right? But, th- but those who can, mm-hmm. uh, well, a lot of those who can already do, but, but, there's, but you know, those who can um, find organizations that advocate for you, advocate on the issues you care about, and donate. It doesn't have to be the Justice Center, although you know, we need donations, and that's, yeah. that's, that's how we function. That's why, we're, why and how we're here. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, that's, that's how you have a healthy society, people that are willing to donate to advocacy organizations to keep those issues alive. Do you want to better understand your legal rights regarding wearing a mask in public places? If so, head to maskexemption.ca. That's where you can find a wallet size exemption card that can be printed or carried in your wallet. And you can also donate to the cost of making them.